It's a fairly graphic image to see a perfectly young, healthy young man connected to machines fighting for his life. It's heartbreaking to me to not have anything to offer to a child who I know is dying in front of me. This is much more prevalent than we ever thought. ICU looks after the sickest patients in the hospital. And somewhere around 25 to 35 percent of all the patients in the intensive care unit have sepsis. So we stop and think about the mortality rate of different conditions. You know, leukemia. In the 1950s, a child who had leukemia, it was, it was virtually a death sentence. And today, the mortality rate from childhood leukemia is often less than 10 percent. The mortality rate from severe sepsis is 30 to 40 percent. Sepsis is a disease that has been around forever. It's really the war between us and invading bacteria. And when you get an infection, when you get a little paper cut, that's not sepsis. That's just a little infection. But when that bacteria makes its way into your bloodstream and you get what's called blood poisoning, that's sepsis. What happens at the level of the cell is every single one of your immune cells gets activated and angry and tries to respond back to that bacteria. The most common organisms that cause sepsis are bacteria. So these are things that you might have heard of. Uh, their names before, Staphylococcus aureus, Streptococcus pneumoniae. They can occur in your bladder or kidney tract. You might have heard of an infection called meningitis, which is an infection of the lining of the brain or infection of the skin, cellulitis or necrotizing fasciitis, what some people call flesh-eating disease. All of these life-threatening infections are what make up sepsis. The most common cause of sepsis is Streptococcus pneumoniae, that's the name of the organism, which for the most part is highly sensitive to one of the most uh, common antibiotics there is, penicillin. Yet we still have 40% of patients who don't survive their first 28 days with a life-threatening infection. It's the number two cause of death in childhood after trauma. And so people are well aware that children die from accidents. But again, they're never, they've never heard the word sepsis and have no idea that children die 10% um, of the time. When they're admitted to an ICU with sepsis, they die 10% of the time. And that's worldwide. So we really need to do a better job because that's not acceptable. Well, we thought everything was all right and then the one that we He'd been, a few days previous, he'd been going, going up and down with his, his belly was distended and then it would go back to normal and it would get distended. And one night we went home and about an hour later we got a phone call that he'd turned in a matter of an hour. He'd grown about two or three times his regular size from his body just being completely poisoned all throughout the whole body. I looked at Riley and something wasn't right and I called Justin and I said, you know, Something doesn't look right. I really don't think that he's going to make it. Like his eyes were very bulgy out of his head. He had lost a lot of weight. Um, I remember, you know, like trying to burp him. His spine was so far out. Um, you know, like his heart rate was extremely high. Um, like his oxygen levels and stuff were so low. Yeah, it just, and then, and then we got that call that we needed to come in and the doctor said to us like, we don't know which way he's going to go and his belly was so big and I had said something um, to the doctors for a few days previously that, you know, his belly was getting bigger and nobody knew. Yeah, but there's no markers for anything. We need to find out what molecules are in the blood that are causing the problems. Okay? It's not just the bacteria. Okay, If you have an enemy and you drop an atomic bomb, there's going to be collateral damage. And that's what your body's doing, is it's killing itself. We've got to figure out what is the atomic bomb, which molecule is causing all the devastation, and then can we target it? It's very, very expensive to care for a patient in the intensive care unit. Upwards of $5,000 a day. And most patients stay in the ICU 20 or 30 days if they survive. It costs about $1,000 a day to stay elsewhere in the hospital. So if it's 20 to 30 days in the ICU, 
40 to 60 days in hospital. And then they take another six months to a year to recover. They can't return to work, they're not paying taxes, they're consuming healthcare resources. This is extremely expensive. So when we received these dollars from Alberta Innovates Health Solutions, we asked ourselves, where is it that we can make the biggest impact? And what we decided is that if we could get every single patient that goes into the ICU that has sepsis, if we could take their blood and have it come through this laboratory and have some of the very best scientists look at that blood, biochemists, immunologists, microbiologists, and say, this is what's happening, we then would begin to appreciate that disease and make huge impact on how to treat that disease. To be able to see what's actually happening inside the liver in real time when somebody has infection, it, it's almost like Star Trek and science fiction. It is amazing and it is helping us understand how to care for patients better. In the future I'm hoping to be able to find this disease earlier so that I can give them interventions and not have those conversations where I say there's nothing else that I can do for your child and that we never even have to go down the road of talking about death or quality of life for long-term effects of this disease. If we get, get it early, fix them and send them home, then they can have, live a normal, happy life. So I think the impact this program can make is huge and that's why I'm so optimistic. Uh, I, I have been studying many different aspects of human disease and have decided to dedicate the next 20 years of my life till retirement on this particular disease because I'm absolutely convinced this is where we can make the biggest impact.